So I guess it is not quad, it's not hexad. I think it is going to be in the fitting in the system of triad. Um, it's going to be gene transfer from Arabidopsis to soybean and checking with the third component with a pathogen. So I guess that's where I am. So this is a soybean meeting. So Iowa World Conference. So um, I guess this slide is probably not so important, but anyways, just to refresh your um, uh, familiarity with the importance of soybean, I just thought that bring this slide. So it's a $40 billion industry. That's why we are all here probably. Um, it's also very important uh, nutritionally for human health as well as um, uh, for animal and feces. And also it's a, becoming a source of biodiesels. And then also it, it improves the soil health as well because it fixes nitrogen through our ready high, our high, rhizobium species, uh, and so it uh, improved the soil quality for nitrogen. Okay. Um, so the problem with soybean uh, cultivation is that it is also uh, suffers seal suppression from a series of pathogens, and, and this slide shows uh, uh, yield suppression in million dollars for um, soybean seeds nematode, which is number one. Um, it's about $1.2 million uh, dollar worth of crop is not, uh, not uh, is suppressed. And then second to that uh, is uh, sudden death syndrome. So in certain years, it can cause up to nearly a bi uh, million dollar. It is in billion, sorry. I take it back. So 1.2 billion for SCN, about 0.5 or so billion for soybean sudden death syndrome. These are the two most important diseases, and I'm interested for both of them so that we can make a dent in the uh, soybean production so we can protect soybean crops and improve farm economy. So here is the slide of sudden death syndrome. Um, sudden death syndrome was uh, identified in 19, early 70s. Uh, during that time, the disease ca causal organism was not detected and thought that it may be caused by some abiotic stress or some nutrient deficiency. And subsequently, the pathogen was discovered in the roots, never go to the disease causing lesions like shown here, which are all caused by toxins. Um, one of the toxins was identified in our lab, uh, which is a proteinaceous, proteinaceous toxin. It is caused by Fusarium bargulliformi, it's a fungal pathogen, and so uh, soil borne and it stays in the root. So the goal of my lab has been always improving soybean for disease resistance, in particularly sudden death syndrome, which is in short SDS. And for soybean cyst nematode, I will start to say SCN, which is also commonly known here. Um, but for SDS, uh, which is becoming an um, emerging disease for the last one decade, uh, the protection is mostly through uh, resistant cultivars. Unfortunately, there is no major resistant genes for uh, this particular pathogen. So like Steve uh, Widham has described about effector triggered immunity ETI or uh, conventionally disease resistant genes, major resistant genes that confer specificity to a certain number of races or isolates is missing in this system. Uh, so, a number of um, um, QTL quantitative trait loci, each one contributing about at most 20% maybe, and about 40 are reported already. So, you can imagine that breeding SDS resistant cultivars is going to be so difficult and has been difficult, uh, but that is the sole source of controlling this disease because you cannot spray any fungicide because pathogen stays in the roots. Uh, so. Um, transferring the non-host resistant gene from Arabidopsis uh, was one of the things that we started in back in 2004 with the support of Iowa Soybean Association Board. So that was to work on Arabidopsis and I was so grateful to Iowa Soybean Association to let me work on Arabidopsis for improving soybean. Uh, and then I think it started with uh, support from also consortium of plant biotechnology research 
Uh, and then what we, before I go there, I think I'd like to give you a small overview of what is non-host resistance. Uh, you have heard from Steve William about uh, resistance, uh, host specific resistance, or effector triggered immunity, as well as FAM triggered immunity, which is uh, basal resistance. Um, but this is a new concept, non-host resistance, which is actually uh, broad spectrum. And also, if you think about it, although we always complain about plant diseases, if you think hard, then you see that only very few pathogens can cause disease in a particular crop species. And those are known as host pathogens or pathogens. But most of the pathogens cannot cause disease to any crop species. They are known as non-host pathogens. So for example, mast is immune to, I think, all the soybean pathogens. I hope it is. Maybe they can penetrate, and but they cannot cause any disease. Similarly, Soybean, uh, maize pathogen cannot uh, infect soybean. So that's why we have this system of crop rotation so that we can minimize the um, soil borne pathogens uh, and give a protection to the crop species. So similarly, Arabidopsis is also completely immune to or immune to most of the soybean pathogens. And the other an important thing to remember is broad non-host is uh, also broad spectrum and should be durable. Uh, these slides I brought uh, bring, uh, to show you just a cartoon uh, of the, what we talk about immune susceptible and resistant responses. So this is what we can only detect under a microscope. So you cannot see the responses of a host when we have immune response. So pathogen barely penetrate or it cannot penetrate. So it lands on the uh, surface and then fail to penetrate. And this is a hypersensitive cell that initiated by this penetration. So, so then pathogen has to evolve to be able to become a pathogen in that particular species through mutations. And it takes time and so they have to lose a lot of, you know, they have to gain a lot of effectors like Steve Widham has discussed today. And eventually they will gain some of the effectors or pathogen proteins, which can suppress all the vessel resistance mechanism and cause susceptibility or susceptible host response where pathogen is able to establish and cause disease. And after that, the plant will evolve with resistant gene and which is known as effector trigger immunity or host specific resistance or race specific resistance. So I guess non-host resistance will probably uh, classify under immune response here. And this is just to show you what has been happened as a glimpse of the non-host resistance research. And I have been always interested to work on this area, but I was not brave enough to start the process. I only started when, in 2003, uh, Paul's Sal effort uh, lab has published three different uh, cloning of three genes in Arabidopsis that are important for penetration by the powdery mildew pathogen of barley. So the first paper appeared in 2003 for PEN1. And the PEN1 is actually a syntax in protein and that is involved in transporting hydrogen peroxide or free radicals into the infection sites, suppressing the penet penetration by the crucerium. Um, second protein was cloned PAN2 and then PAN3 subsequently, and then they showed that PAN2 is actually encoding a glycoside hydrolase, so that releases the toxic compounds that are uh, by removing the glycoside residues and then causing more potent toxic antimicrobial compounds, which are then released to the crucium by the ABC transporter. So these two components act together. So basically there are two different mechanisms were identified. There is also another gene cloned by Jianming Zhou in Kansas State University in Manhattan by Jianming Zhou, uh, oh sorry, yeah, at that end cause glycerol kinase called NHO1. So both groups kindly uh, provided us the seeds in 2003 back in 
those two papers appeared, so they kindly provided the seeds and we tested the first hypothesis whether any of those two mutants were also susceptible to uh, uh, soybean pathogen Phytophthora soji. What we found was that NHO1, which encodes a uh, glycerol kinase and confers non-host resistance to bacterial pathogens, failed to uh, be penetrated by Phytophthora soji, which is a soybean pathogen. But uh, this is Colombia. There is nothing happening here. This is a zoo spores mm -hmm. landing on the surface of the Colombia and no penetration, nothing, nothing. But here, we were surprised to see that PEN1 was penetrated by the soybean uh, Phytophthora soji and single cell death and nothing happens after that. So we decided that since the first layer is gone in this mutant, PEN1, so we took that as the first starting point for identifying additional genes which may be involved in uh, conferring that immunity in this uh, PAN1 mutant. With that, we developed the system. We identified mutant by making uh, uh, EMS mutant, which is ethyl methyl sulfonate induced mutants, about 3,500 individual mutants. And from screening that, uh, we named all the mutants as uh, Phytophthora soji susceptible PSS. So we identified 30 uh, PSS mutants. And then subsequently what we did was we inoculated with the second soybean pathogen, which is Fusarium virguliforme, as I have told you, it, it causes sudden death syndrome. And that is the main focus of my lab for the last 10, 15 years. So we are asking the question, um, how many of the 30 PSS mutants are also infected by Fusarium virguliforme? So here, is, here are the few of the, uh, out of 14, I'm presenting here only eight, I think, or six. So you can see that the gradation of the susceptibility of these mutants are also not consistently same. For example, PSS1 is barely infected by the pathogen where certain cases, some of the mutants are severely uh, compromised for their immunity. So next step was obviously to clone those, uh, map those mutants. So using these mutants, we develop uh, breeding population or segregating populations to map individually all those mutants. And we started, uh, so far we have been able to map um, eight PSS mutants. So we created, say, eight populations, so mapped all those eight. They actually surprisingly mapped to seven loci. So when we got 30 mutants, we thought that we are probably going to have only few. Um, OK, so, so then only in one case, 20 and 25 mutants, they are mapped to the same locus. Rest of them are individually suggesting that they may confer uh, separate mechanism or di different mechanisms for immunity. So these genes are cloned, and they are um, applying a map-based cloning approach. We clone um, six, of the six of the genes. Apart from PSS5, all five are already in transgenic lines. PSS5 encodes unknown protein, so it is yet to be transformed into soybean plant. Um, so we then focus on uh, asking the question how much, uh, how, uh, whether any of the transgenic lines are uh, can confer to resistance to Fusarium virguliforme or soybean cisnematode. Um, so here I just summarize the results of all the experiments in single slide. Um, so you can see that PSS1 can confer SDS resistance, not SCN. PSS6 can confer SDS resistance, not SCN. PSS21 can confer SDS, not SCN. But PSS25 barely give little bit of resistance to SDS, but there is some resistance to SCN. The most promising one is PSS30, uh, which has uh, resistance uh, into both pathogens. Um, so just to um, PSS1 encodes glycine-rich protein. 
PSS5 unknown protein, PSS6 a vesicle associated membrane protein, and 21 ABC like protein, 25 NCOS bell family homeodomain protein, and 30 folate transporter. So, as you can see, that each of the genes encode distinct classes of protein. So, suggesting that different mechanisms are involved in non host resistance. We have also conducted field trial for PSS1 and PSS30, and we, we can show you the results of two year field trial. So, first, initially, we evaluated all those transgenic lines uh, under growth chamber conditions, and then subsequently, we bring the transgenic lines to the field. So, two trials have been finished, and this year, 2017, we have the third one. Um, so, what you can I can show you here is that this is the control non transgenic. So, this is the, the SDS severity of mean. So, you can see up to six score or six and a half or seven. And many of the line, there are also three different promoters like PS promoter one, two, and ubiquitin promoters. So, many of the ind three independent lines from each of the promoter are shown here. Data, the, um, so, you can see that the, some of the lines are uh, quite good. and and also consistently in both here, some of the lines are showing, but there are also some lines that are not so good. Uh, promoter one is shown to be not so active for conferring, uh, you know, so, but this is a good control for rest of it, so some of the lines are showing uh, scores in around one or so, one or two. So then this is the result of the uh, PSS 30. So again, um, in this case, you can see that, um, um, uh, the transgenic lines are doing happy here, but uh, controls are gone. Again, in this slide, the presentation is a little bit different. So here we are showing SDS resistant plants. So means anything score below two are considered as, uh, and uh, William said it is uh, not, nothing is resistant in this year. So about 40% or 60%, depending upon the construct we have. Uh, is, here is also, this is R1 generation, means the transgenic lines are still segregating. Some of the lines, I suspect that they are uh, not uh, having the transgenes. But 2016, we had uh, homozygous line. Most of them are homozygous lines. Uh, and then you can also see that 80% or so uh, plants are showing resistance. So this is the control. Uh, MN 1606, it, may, it is having close to 100, and it is also homozygous line. And William 72, which is the non transgenic line, is only 10% or less escape. Important part is that we also found that about female index of those transgenic lines are uh, about 30 to 40% uh, as compared to control William 72. So, conclusion, uh, we have shown evidence that transfer of Arabidopsis non-host resistant gene can enhance this resistance in soybean, and this approach could be also applicable to other crop species. A large number of genes with distinct mechanisms confer non-host resistance. Non-host resistance is broad spectrum, as you can see, SDS and SCN resistance encoded by PSS30. And here, acknowledging the uh, involved people involved, these are all people who have uh, left the lab, ex uh, postdoc and uh, graduate students and current student, uh, current uh, scientists here. And I am thankful to Iowa Soybean Association Consortium Plant Biotechnology Research and also ISO Transformation Facility. From 2004 to 2012, uh, as well as I think Iowa Soybean continued to up to 2000. 16, we got support for a non-host project. And also, then 2013, we have been supported by uh, National Institute of Food and a NIFA grant uh, under every project. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Go ahead. Very good question. That's what we are currently doing. So the question is that whether since the mechanisms of these genes are shown to be different, so it will make sense to put them together so that you can increase or enhance the uh, resistance mechanism, so uh, resistance of these in transgenic lines. And actually what happened is that uh, this is only non-host. There is another project in the lab 
funded by Iowa Soybean Association also. In that one, we have uh, modified the promoter of some of the soybean genes which are suppressed by infection. One of that, is, there is a poster here, you can go and have a look. So what we found is that that gene is uh, even better than the probably PS30, that because it confers not only, when you change the promoter from uh, 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 using an infection inducible promoter to these genes which are suppressed by infection. So it's only few genes are suppressed by during pathogen infection. So we thought that maybe somehow pathogen has a mechanism to suppress it to cause disease. So we changed the promoters and we found that in each case we can improve resistance. So there are three genes I think we have already characterized. So we are currently making crosses. This year we made crosses between PSS30 and DS1. So, so then I think that eventually I think we'll also include PSS1 into the system, but to test the hypothesis we are studying that. Yeah, good question. Yep, he said. So you are asking me non-infected plants to do our... Well, just with, yeah. your, with your transformed plants and all yeah. the control under infection and non-infection. Yeah. So the question is that since we have these resources, have you tried to study what kind of pathways are regulated by these different defense genes or non-host resistant genes um, by infecting or without infection of the transgenic lines? And the answer is no. Uh, maybe in future. Hi, you Sylvia. Have, yeah. Have you, uh, have you made the experiment in the Indian in PSS1 and PSS30 and then at the end of DS? Yeah, yeah. Um, have you gone to determine uh, the difference? There are differences in the infected proteins and, uh, that are being produced in the plant? By, by the pathogen? Uh, pet effector proteins from the fusarium vargulifermi? Yes, yes. Fusarium vargulifermi, I think effector concept is very poorly understand, understood. So I think that fusarium vargulifermi has some secretory proteins. We published a paper. Um, but I don't know how fusarium vargulifermi works, whether they use toxin, it is kind of considered to be hemibiotropic, means it has a short period of biotropic phase and a long period of, or most of the time it is as a necrotrophic phase. For necrotrophic phase fungus, uh, I think that effect or protein concept is less well developed, right, Steven? Yeah, so, but any rate, uh, if the short answer to your question is that no, we have not done that uh, study to see what effect or proteins are involved. If any, we don't know what effect or proteins are involved in the normal soybean fusarium vargulifarm interaction. Uh, so I mean, she's about what we are just trying to see if they are resistant at this moment. Yeah. 